Excellent. So thank you for letting people know about that. That's yeah. awesome. You bet. Uh, I'll make one okay. last final announcement. We are recording today's webinar, so if you have colleagues or um, people in your department that couldn't be with us that uh, you wanted had to have this information shared, it will be on the Rails CE archives within a matter of a few days. Uh, but with that, for Andrew, we can see your screen and your slides, so off you go. Wonderful, and thanks again, everybody, for attending. If you would, over in the question area, just give me a, a yes or a no on how the volume's coming through for you. I like to make sure that technology is trying to be our friend as much today as possible. So I will be monitoring the question area throughout the day today um, and throughout the program just to see if you have any questions or comments or different things on the material that I'm presenting. So we will look for those as we go through the program. And, uh, and I say, let's go ahead and get started. Um, here's what I want us to um, focus on today. And uh, this is uh, also part of the description that was sent out. So my hope is you will be expecting these things. Uh, but I certainly do want to talk about just what's going on with these angry uh, patrons or customers, depending on the verbiage that you use in your library. And the first question I have for you, and the first thing that I'd like to find out from you is just how many really angry patrons are you getting in a day? And I'd be real interested to see what that looks like for you in your library. So how many angry patrons do you get in a day? How many do you get in a week? Because the majority of times, and, and the majority of people tell me that they don't get many, but unfortunately, they tend to be very memorable. And that, I think, is kind of a good way to describe angry patrons. Uh, most times, we we have a minimum amount, but man, they can put on a show, and they can do some different things, and things can get kind of yucky with them. So... You know, keep that in mind, and I would just say, remember remember the good ones, too, um, because they're out there and they do come visit us and what's going on. Um, just to let um, Joe know, Joe, I am not seeing anything coming through in the question area at all, and I don't know if you are or not, but okay. I'm not getting it. Well, let me look at that, but I will just read the responses to that question that most are saying um, one to two a week. Um, some are okay. saying maybe one in a day. Haven't seen more than really one in a, in a day. And I'll work on the, the questions while we, while we go forward. Cool. All right. Thanks. Okay. So you guys have seen the lineup for today. So let's go ahead and, and let's just drop into the material here. First of all, I have a secret. I don't have many, so this is kind of a good one. Uh, and that secret is the material we're going to cover today is not only valid in your library, it is valid in life. Did you have something there, Joe? No? Uh, okay. no, no, go ahead. Okay, very good. Um, so you'll be able to use these techniques, you'll be able to use this material, uh, not only in your workplace, but certainly at home, certainly when you're out being a customer, certainly when you're um, just engaging with other people. Um, I'm a big believer that life is about relationships and the quality of our relationships um, says a lot about our workplace. Um, and, and think about what your library would be like if you didn't have good relationships with people. I, I think you might not even have a library if you want to think about it that way. Some wonderful resources that, that, that I certainly love and, and hope that you will take a look at. If you're not familiar with uh, Warren Graham's work in the Black Belt Librarian, certainly worth a look. I've actually captured one of the phrases that he uses uh, and he recommends in his workshops. I've seen Warren, gosh, probably three, four times now and always enjoy um, watching him and, and learning from him. And then I found a couple other um, really good books. I, I like the work of Robert Bacall. Uh, he has quite a few uh, different things on customer service. Uh, you may find the perfect phrases uh, for customer service to be handy. And then uh, I also like that Renee Evanson book on uh, phrases for dealing with difficult people. So you'll probably see me wrapping some of those things in the material as we go here. I've um, got a quote for you to start, and many of you may know Amy 
from uh, Parks and Recreation, and uh, I, you know, I've actually never seen that show, uh, but I heard it's quite good. I actually hear she has a, a very interesting relationship with a librarian in that show. Uh, but anyway, this quote, uh, I actually heard her say this when I was driving somewhere around the country, and uh, she was being interviewed on NPR. And she said this quote, and I just had this, I literally did stop the car and pull over, and, and I ended up writing it down because I said, you know, this is really, really good. And so she talks about knowing our currency. And immediately I started to think about the different types of programs and, and specifically this one having to do with these angry, upset, um, not behaving very well patrons. And I started to think about what is my currency with that type of patron. And Amy went on in the interview to say that she really figured out early on that looks were not gonna be her currency. And in essence, she said, you know, there are a lot skinnier women, there are a lot prettier women that are, are trying to get these jobs at Hollywood and TV, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, I knew that my currency was that I was gonna outwork them. I knew that I was going to outresearch them, I was going to outsmart them, uh, and I knew going forward that those were my currencies. And that just really struck me. And I thought, wow. How smart is that? So you could look as a, at a currency as like a skill. You could look at it as a strength. Uh, and what I want you to think about, and, and unfortunately I can't see your answers in the question area, but what I, I would like you to maybe even write down or, or type in there, um, what is it that you see as one of your currencies when dealing with an angry, upset patron? And actually, I am starting to see some of your things now in the question area. Hooray! So go ahead and type in for me, if you would, what are some of your strengths? I'm seeing empathy. I'm seeing uh, patience. Um, give me some more. Good listener. Uh, yeah, and, and I do think listening is so uh, incredibly important in these situations. So remaining calm. Um, unflappability. That in itself is a great skill. Um, so good for you on doing that. Uh, listening, let's see, I generally know the answers to their issues, which is helpful um, if they really want their problem answered. Um, there are some patrons, I think, that, that really don't. They just kind of want to vent and, you know, do whatever they're going to do. Not allowing the patron to see that they've upset me. Uh, we're going to talk about that specifically, why would you let that upset you? We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and not taking things personally there is, is certainly where I want to go with that. Um, Non-confrontational, so good, 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 good. Thank you guys for that. Um, let's go through these, and I just want to make sure that you guys are kind of comfortable. I'm going to use these as foundational pieces um, for the program here. So just give me a yes or a no over in that question area if you're good with this first slide. So just yes or no, does that make sense to you? Okay, good. Lots of yeses and goods, okay. Let's go to the next one as well. How do you see this one? And if you wanna type in, what's some of the more outrageous behavior that you've witnessed? What's some of the more outrageous things that you've seen? I mean, I've had things thrown at me, library cards, DVDs, CDs, that's, you know, kind of like not a big deal to me. Um, okay, throwing books. Ooh, knocking a computer, that would be not a happy moment. Um, a woman getting undressed in the study room with the glass walls. That would probably be um, uh, an experience. Um, a patron mooned you, I've never had that. Um, yeah, spitting the, yeah, the threats, I pay your salary, um, foul language, yeah, okay. Threats to life, I would say we have to look at very seriously, uh, and, and I would not be ignoring that. I would be taking that um, into some type of action. The library sucks, so I'm never coming back. Well, maybe that's okay. I'll get into that in a minute. 
um, with what that may look like. All right, what about this one? Are we comfortable with this? So sometimes they have a reason for being unhappy. You know, because sometimes, you know, mistakes happen. They do, and, and I just have to acknowledge, you know, sometimes our systems may not work the way we wanted them to, could be a process problem. I, and dare I say, because I'm brave, maybe our policy just really isn't that good, or maybe it doesn't really serve, you know, either the customer, whether it be the external or the internal one. Sometimes I do think that our, our policies need to be looked at uh, and what's going on, and, and that's okay. What I do want you to, I hope, get comfortable with is that most times they're not angry with you. Now, they may be very angry at our organization. They may be very angry at our department. Um, those I acknowledge and, and I'm comfortable with. Um, but most times, even though it may feel like we are taking things personally or it feels like it's personal, most times it's not. It can feel personal, it can feel like we're being attacked, I get it. One of the things I want you to consider is that when this anger is being thrown at you, to maybe look at a different angle. And that is that if someone is angry, they are suffering. Now, many times we won't know what that suffering is about. And quite honestly, we probably don't need to know. When I was working with Denver Public Library, I really loved one of the changes in the philosophy of customer service that took place there. When we had someone acting out in front of us, instead of looking at that person and saying, you know, what's wrong with them? Why are they acting that way? The, the question, the reframe that was used was to instead ask the question to ourselves, what happened to that person? You know, what's happened to that person that's got them to where they are in this moment? And the truth is we don't know. But what I like about that approach is I do think it lends us to a more empathetic look, a more emp empathetic approach um, with, with these situations. One of the things I also know is true is that hurt people do tend to hurt people. So if they are angry, they are suffering, there's a good possibility that they may lash out and they may lash out at us because you know what, we're the one behind the service desk or we're the one that was out on the floor and they happen to, well, just my lucky day, they happen to come to me. If you came to this webinar and you were hoping for a magic pill or a silver bullet on how we can just handle these angry patrons, first of all, I wish I could deliver it to you, but I'll let Grumpy Cat handle that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, but that that's it, it won't happen. And that's because customer service is situational and the situations, well, you know, I talked about our currencies and you guys gave me your list of currencies. And you know, sometimes listing is the answer and sometimes listing doesn't work. And sometimes patience is the answer, and sometimes patience doesn't work. I like to use humor, and sometimes humor can work, and sometimes humor doesn't work. And so that's why I can't give you the magic. Gosh, the webinar would have been over if I could have, right? Like in 15 minutes. All right, so here are some things, though, that we can do. And number one is we need to know our policies. Now, every library has different policies. So I don't want you to know the nation's policies, I want you to know your own. So what are your policies with regards to angry patrons, disruptive patrons, behavior that is outside of our guidelines? And I find a lot of times that consistency is what gets us into trouble. I have a daughter who is now graduated from college and has applied to vet school and we're going through that process now. And when we were living in St. Pete, Florida, I knew which library branches to go to that would waive fines. I knew which library branches were more lenient than others. What I'm telling you is your patrons are smart. 
and they know. And they know who doesn't necessarily want to follow all the policies and they know who they can get away with, with different things. And unfortunately, that can set up more of these angry problems because we can have someone who says, well, so-and-so got to do this and they may be right. But then here I am looking to enforce the policy. Hmm. So I would ask you guys a little more heightened awareness of what's going on with consistency and things that we can do to be more consistent. And in situations where a patron is really acting out, I want you to use your gut. I mean, what is your gut telling you? If your gut says that this may not be safe, you need to be taking the appropriate action. If your gut tells you, listen, okay? That may be one of the great takeaways for the day. All right, this, um, oh, just give me a yes or no if you ever worked in retail in your life. Did you ever work in retail? Okay, for all of you that are saying yes, my answer would be yes, unfortunately, or I'm sorry. Uh, retail's hard. It's very hard, and, and once again, same type of thing. We're dealing with the public, and I see Lisa's um, comment here. This was the first rule that I learned, and as a manager in retail, uh, food service is good too. Uh, boy, this was shoved down my throat. The customer is always right, and I would say, no, they're not always right. Um, customers lie. Customers steal. Customers do a lot of things that are not right. So I kind of agree with Grumpy Cat here. Um, no, I, I don't buy this at all. Um, and I do think that philosophically, this is changing. Although, <laughs> you know, I just did this workshop, uh, the face-to-face -face workshop, and I had one of the audience members say to me, because, I, well, let me take you where I'm taking you. I, I think the question, is the customer is always right, is, is really a bad question. And I think it's really not the question to ask. I think this is the better question. Is this a patron that we want to keep? Because if the behaviors are not what we have, or they're not what we want, we have a code of conduct, we have these different things, then why in the world are we keeping this patron? I can tell you they're scaring away other patrons. I can tell you they're making other staff members uncomfortable. Um, why are we putting up with the damage? So this to me, I hope becomes the question that we ask. Is this, this a patron worth keeping? Quite frankly, even in my small Haywood County, North Carolina libraries, there are patrons here we don't wanna keep. I don't want them in my library. And that's why we have code of conducts and different things. All right, back to my story. The lady that was in my workshop, I had brought this up and I was talking to them about what behaviors you allow and what you do not allow and when you might suspend and when you might ban, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, well, she said, you know, my library director believes that it is easier to keep a patron than to go find a new one. And I said, even a disruptive one. And she said, yes. And I said, you know, that is wrong on so many levels. I said, number one, it's lack thinking, which probably bothers me the most. Because what you're telling me is that there either aren't enough patrons out there or it's too much work to get a new patron. And I, and I just told the group, I said, it's a bunch of BS. I said, there are more than enough people out there that wanna use our library. And you know what? It's probably that patron that you're keeping in here who's causing all the problems that's scaring them away. Did you ever think about that? Of course not. Okay, customer focused. Okay. One of the things I learned uh, is that in the library world, we often have to say no uh, and do so more than in retail. Could be, okay. Wouldn't that lead to a lot of homeless patrons being tossed out, um, is a, a question here. Well, that would depend, wouldn't it? Because is their behavior disruptive? See, to me, that's how you define disruptive. 
So I'd have to look at your policies. I'd have to look at how you view homelessness. To me, a homeless person could be less disruptive than someone talking on a cell phone. So my immediate answer would be no, but I would need to look at your policies. There's a great video out there called Stuck on an Escalator. <sighs> Selfless promo here. If you do come to the workshop in May, you will see the video, and I adore it. And it has so many purposes. But it's about two people. It's an award-winning commercial from Canada. And it's about two people that are stuck on an escalator, and there's a picture of them, and they aren't moving. And they actually just keep standing there and they complain and they yell and they scream and do different things. And I love this video because to me it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for us to think about where we get stuck. And that can be organizationally or that could be even individually. So are we having problems with patrons because of a policy that's really not effective? Sometimes it happens. And more to the point for this program is where do you get stuck in these interactions? Where do you get stuck? And I don't need you to type it in, but I want you to reflect on that. And I want you to think about where do you shut down? Where do you feel like you just can't handle that patron anymore? Not here at all to say what is good or bad or right or wrong, but acknowledging within you where you may be getting stuck. Some people tell me that if a patron curses at them, that they, they just can't handle that. Some people say if they yell and scream or they get in their personal space, that once again, that that's when they, they, they shut down or they escalate or different things that happen. I hope you'll maybe try to grasp this thought. These patrons are here actually to teach us things about ourselves and about our organizations. So if you find that cursing is something that causes you to get stuck and that this is happening again and again, well, I'm a big believer that the lesson keeps coming back until you finally get it. So if it is cursing that is something that really causes you a problem, then the question you may want to ask yourself is, how do you need to handle this differently? Hmm. All right, I see one more comment here. Homeless patrons, in my experience, are usually the best behaved because they don't want to be asked to leave. Um, for the most part, I found that to be true as well. There are some, you know, like any other classification, if that's what we want to do of our patrons, there are some that act out. There are some that, you know, that that also can be problems. All right, so let's look at some different things here on tips for de-escalating uh, an angry patron's behavior. And the first thing that I think is a, a very good technique to use is that it can be appropriate to transfer the patron. Now, this can be done with people that are on the phone. This can be done with people that are actually in our building. Shoot, I guess I could even say with people on our website if we have a, a chat function or something like that as well. This can be an effective tool. My question for you, though, has to do with when is it appropriate? Hmm. So what do you think about these? Is it appropriate to transfer the patron when they ask for a supervisor? I've had some people tell me no. Some people say, well, Andrew, I'd like to find out what the problem is because they may not need a supervisor. Interesting. I see the downside of that because let's say that they do tell me the whole problem and then I can't help them and then they have to repeat everything for the supervisor. But I get it. I did a lot of work internationally with, uh, through Carnival Corporation as an adjunct professor for them. And many times I would get asked, especially in European countries, why is it that American customers always ask for the CEO? They always ask for a manager. They always ask for da 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 And I said, well, I said, in our culture, we've kind of learned that most people on the front lines don't have a lot of empowerment. And so 
it, it's actually easier for us just to ask for the supervisor. And that was really a foreign concept for them. It's like, well, but we can do everything they need. Why, why are they asking? And I said, it's cultural with that. All right, if you can't help them, why would you continue? All you're gonna do is irritate them. Maybe they do need to be transferred to someone else. When a second voice is needed, and boy, this technique can really work. And you know what, it doesn't need to be a supervisor. Many times I have given the second voice to just another coworker who's told them pretty much the same thing again and again, and I guess they get it. All right, and then if you're not authorized to give it to them, then to me, transferring the patron seems like it's probably gonna be a, a pretty good technique. Well, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. Well, I'd like to, but um, I need to connect you with whoever to make that happen. And, and there was a mistake there I just made in my verbiage. Please don't say the word but. As a matter of fact, only focus on what you can do for them, uh, not what you cannot do. All right, so let's look at um, relating an angry, angry patron's behavior. And, and I have to ask, what do you think of that girl with the, you suck this much? What do you think of that? I, I'm like in love with this girl. I actually went out and got the button. So I wear the button because I just think it's really cool. Um, yeah, I, uh, adorable to me too. It, and, you know, because just that, you know, you, I guess it's that you don't expect that from, you know, this little girl who would be doing that. So, okay. So let's look at threatening patrons because I, I certainly think we need to acknowledge that those things are happening. Um, I pay your salary. I know the mayor. Um, my, my mom's best friend is on the library board. Yeah, okay. I, uh, we've probably heard most of those, if not more. Uh, and the truth is threats are meant to intimidate you in the hopes that you are then going to give them whatever it is that they want. Okay, well, I'm gonna to go to the director. Okay, great. You can go to the director. As a matter of fact, are we clear? Patrons are allowed to be angry. Are we, are we comfortable with that? Just give me a yes or a no. They're allowed to be angry. Are we okay with that? They are, just like you're allowed to be angry as a customer. It's where the behavior goes from there that we then need to start making decisions. Correct, they can't be abusive. They can be angry. All right, so for you, keep calm, keep your responses focused on the issue at hand because the threats may start to feel pretty personal. Okay, so just because they're attacking you personally does not mean that you have then the free will to give it back. I call that the power dance. And, and you'll see the power dance go on from time to time, you know, where one person yells and the other person yells back. And the other person yells back again. And, and, and we do this dance. Of course, no one wins the dance, um, but it's something you certainly can observe. All right, so how are threats uh, from the spreading patrons being handled? I think this is very important for us to look at organizationally. Um, and what's going on. I'm not a big fan of ignoring threats. Oh, give me an idea of who on the webinar here has security in their building. Do you have security in your building? Just give me a yes or a no. We don't have that here in Haywood County. We're small. So um, security is, is just something that, that's not available for us. Um, we would have to call the, the police. Uh, maintenance is our security, interesting. Okay, cameras. I mean, cameras are good for really like recapping what happened. Uh, I'm not sure in real time that that's best. So warnings to stop behavior. I am so comfortable with this and, and, and I'm such in favor of it. You know what, if the behavior is inappropriate, then the warning needs to be given. I like Warren Graham. And, and what he says in the Black Belt Librarian, and if you need to write this down, please do. He says, that behavior is not allowed in our library. Now, that could be cursing, that could be yelling, screaming, whatever it is. 
cursing is not allowed in our library. I love it. It's straight to the point. And by the way, did you notice there's no you, there's no your, there's no type of word in there that would make it, in essence, personal to the person that you are giving the warning to. Cursing is not allowed in our library. You could say, I'd like to help you, and cursing is not allowed in our library. I think I've got a few more for you as we go through here. Suspension of library privileges. It happens. We have suspended people for the day. We suspended people for a week. And, you know, there are some people that, you know, I'm sorry for them, but they don't belong in the library. Sorry. And for those folks, I do believe banning is the way to go. These are the realities of the tools that we have to proceed. My hope is that you're using your tools and that you're applying them as consistently as possible. Everyone can do a warning. At you know, some levels, I can't suspend people and I can't ban people. That would have to go further up the chain in what's going on. What if the angry patron is also mentally unstable? Well, once again, I'm not concerned about labels. I'm concerned about the behavior. Whether they're mentally unstable or mentally stable, or they forgot to take their meds, or whatever it is, I'm focused on the behavior. If the behavior is outside of the lines of what we deem is reasonable and expected, then we take action from there. And thank you for that question. All right. I think these are good for us to remember. And notice I used the word most because it's not true for all. The bottom of the slide really is what I super want to call your attention to. What are we doing to encourage the behavior? What are we doing to encourage the behavior? And this is where you need to assess yourself. And you need to look at what are, for instance, your hot buttons. What are the behaviors? What are the words that people say that cause you to lose control, even if it's a little bit, that cause you to get anxious, that cause you maybe to yell back? because you can acknowledge without encouraging. Give me some phrases that you would use to acknowledge without encouraging the patron to continue, whether it's they're being difficult or whether they're being angry. What are some of the phrases that you use to acknowledge, but not to encourage them to keep going on and on and on? Tina says, I hear what you're saying. That's an acknowledging statement. It's not, I hear what you're saying and, and keep going. Um, I hear your concerns. I understand. I, I understand is a great framing type of, of uh, verbiage to use with people. I see a lot of I understands coming in. Oh, interesting. Oh, wow, that's unusual. <laughs> but that's a whole lot better than, gosh, you know, we had a, patron that told us that the other day too, or, you know, we've had a lot of complaints about that. If you ever say that, I'm going to find you. I'm going to find you and I'm going to say, why would you say that? That may be true, but the patron doesn't need to know that. All you're doing is acknowledging and giving them more fuel to be upset. I'd love to thank you for bringing that to our attention. Quite frankly, they may be actually helping us with the problem that we have going on. It's okay to be angry. Maybe we can help. Ooh, that one's on the edge for me. And that's okay. Because we all look at this through our own lens and, and, and our life experiences. I understand, or what can I do to help you? Um, 
can the speaker read what he's talking about, questions he's addressing, since the rest of us can't see the chat? Okay, thank you for that, I will. So I'm just kind of reading their comments here, but not telling you that it's a comment. Um, okay, any other ones? Um, a comment here, I see where you're coming from. Uh, yes, I understand why you're upset. Be careful with that because you may not, but it, it may sound good that you're saying that. I understand why you're upset, but they may say, well, do you really? And then you may have to get into some other conversation there you don't want to get into. I'd like to talk about um, emotion versus logic. When these situations are going on, we are dealing with people that most of the times are not in their rational or logical mind. And because of that, where they're coming from is going to be from the emotional part of the brain. And so the saying that I like to, to use for my workshops and, and share it with you here is that, and, and please write this down, is that you cannot have a logical conversation with an emotional person. Once again, you cannot have a logical conversation with an emotional person. And the reason is they're not ready. So you may feel like it's time to problem solve, or you may feel like it's time to ask questions and get facts, because as we know, when people are angry and they are maybe venting to us, that a lot of times we may not be getting much of the real picture of what's going on, or we may not have all of the information. One of the techniques that I like, by the way, when their venting has calmed down and we're able to take the next step, and I wanna show you this hostility curve as well. And this talks about, so, <laughs> I'm a strange bird, but when we have people that, that go off in their vent, their anger. I, I remember this curve and in my head I'm like, okay, they're taking off, you know, and here they go. And then what we're looking for is them to get to the top of the curve. And this is where we can use those statements, right? Being, boy, I, I understand, um, you know, that you're upset. I, I hear your concerns. Those are the supportive comments to get them down to where they're at more of a rational behavior level, and then I can start to ask questions um, to, to solve their problem. And so asking someone to problem solve, to be logical when they're still in takeoff, or what it is that they need is supportive comments, you may find that that escalates the issue even further. And that's where we need to be careful. All right, so a question, how do you handle a patron's behavior if based on a medical issue without discriminating against them? Okay, first of all, the question's very general. So this is not gonna be real easy for me to answer. I still go back to, I don't care if it's a medical issue. I don't care if they're homeless. I don't care. What I care about is, is the behavior within the guidelines of our organization? That's where my focus is. It's not on their medical issue. It's not on their homelessness. It has to do with, these are our guidelines. This is our code of conduct. Your current behavior is outside of that code of conduct. And that's where I keep the conversation. And be, with that, I have no worries about discrimination. I have no worries about labeling. None of it, because it's not relevant. What's relevant is, these are the rules if you want to use our library. And we do that for your protection. I won't tell the patron this, but I'm doing it for the staff, and I'm doing it for the other patrons that are in the building. That's where I go with that. All right, if their behavior is inappropriate. Love the quote here. You teach people how to treat you by what you allow, what you stop, and what you reinforce. I found that to be very true. So if you not tell people 
that they're making us uncomfortable, if we do not tell them that that behavior is not allowed in the library, then they're going to believe it's okay. There's a, a quote that I love, let me make sure I don't butcher it. Um, but behavior that is rewarded is behavior that is repeated. And I don't know the source, I'm sorry. Behavior that is rewarded is behavior that is repeated. So if someone is coming in and they are doing things and we are not setting boundaries, we are not telling them, reinforcing what the code of conduct is, we in essence are rewarding the behavior. And that is on us, not them. Pavlov, I'm not sure about, maybe Joe can look that up while he's in the background there listening to the program. Joe, look up and, and see who said that behavior that is rewarded is behavior that is repeated. I'll see if I can find it. Thank you, sir. And what I want you guys to think about is how comfortable are you in setting boundaries? I'll be honest with you. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I was not nearly as comfortable as I am today. That took some practice. That took some confidence in myself. And it also means I have to know management has my back. If I don't believe management has my back, I'm gonna behave differently. Does that make sense? If management doesn't have my back and I don't know that I'm supported, well, I may not be setting boundaries, maybe the way I should. All right, specific phrases. Yes, that behavior is not in our, in our library, not allowed in our library, down on the bottom. That's from Warren Graham, I love it. I also love our insurance policy prohibits you from doing that. That, where did I hear that? I heard that, I don't know, had to be at a workshop or on a webinar. And man, I was like, ding, 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 that's a winner. Because people want to walk into our staff areas. People want to walk behind the desk. But no, our insurance policy prohibits you from doing that. How do you argue with that if you're the patron? Can tell me you don't like my insurance policy? Well, then you better talk to the county or to whoever about that. All right, I'm uncomfortable when you're standing this close to me. Please step back. I like benefit statement language or just benefit language. For the safety of all our patrons is benefit language. For the safety of children, we do not allow them to run in the library. We do not allow them to climb the stacks. Lead with a benefit statement whenever you can. For the benefit, for the safety of for the we you know the confidentiality of your information whatever it would be if you can lead with benefit statement you have a better chance of that patron buying in now not all situations will allow me to use a benefit statement but i will tell you i look at that right away what's the benefit to them because quite frankly they don't care about my policy they don't what they care about is them and i get that I've used that insurance policy, Brenda is saying, uh, quote, after the library closed, um, still had to call the police for a mental health crisis, but it helped me. Good. I, I'm here just to give you guys tools, different tools that you may find helpful, different things that you can use when you have these different situations going on. My hope is that you'll try them if they work for you. All right, handling angry patrons without taking things personally. Yes or no in the question area, are you aware of the book The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz? Once again, the book is The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And I'm typing it in. Because to me, this book and the information contained within it really helped to change me. Don Miguel talks about, uh, in essence, and, and by the way, these four agreements are agreements that you make with yourself. And unfortunately, my typing doesn't work because my question area won't take it, but that's okay. So the four agreements. These are four agreements you make with yourself. 
be impeccable with your word. Don't make assumptions. Always do your best. Don't take anything personally. Of course, our focus in the program today is don't take anything personally. What Ruiz says is that 90 plus plus percent of things that people say about you are not about you, they're about them. And that was a wow for me. Do you guys that said yes, do you guys have any other takeaways from the, from the book? Um, my other takeaway is he says that whenever people are yelling at you, they're cursing at you, they're saying things about you, they're gossiping about you, whatever it is, that if you internalize that, you are eating their poison. And man, do I love that. Because what that gets me to is, why am I eating their poison? So people come in and they say, oh, you're stupid. All of you people in here are stupid. Well, can we be honest? Have they been following you around for the last five years? And they have come to this conclusion that you're stupid? Of course not. They're angry. They're doing the hurt people, hurt people thing. And so they're looking for what your buttons are. Maybe if they call you stupid, you'll react. Or even worse, or as bad, you'll defend. Well, we're not stupid, and you shouldn't be calling me that. As soon as you go there, you've engaged the fun. And it's not fun. But you've engaged the patron. Now you're way off track to what their problem is. And you're going to have a whole lot more work getting this thing back in control. They're allowed to say that we're stupid. They're allowed to call me stupid. They're venting. It's all they're doing. I don't care. Call me stupid. I've been called a lot worse. How are you guys doing with that? You okay? It's not personal. That's them venting. That's them hurting. That's them doing whatever they can to do to deal with ever what it is that they're dealing with. All right, question, how do you respond to that? Help me there, what do you mean by that? How do I respond to that I'm stupid? Type that in for me, Diane, if you would, so I know what you're... Oh, then I, I don't acknowledge it. I respond to it by ignoring it. I just go away. I just, I, I don't even bring it into my scope. I look at what's the issue here. Because I know I'm not stupid. So why would I even, why would I even let that poison into my body? How do I get a patron to stop venting another question here and get back on track with their problem? My immediate answer is I can't. Because I can't control people and I can't change people. My hope is that by giving supportive comments, my hope is by showing them that I'm listening, that they are going to see those things and they are going to tone down. Now, there's some people that just want to continue to vent. And if I have those, then I may use and, and suggest that you say, I can tell that you're upset and this really needs to be a situation that is brought to the supervisor, that's brought to the director, whatever that may be. I find most times people want to be heard. I don't like it, it's disrespectful and should not be allowed, is a comment. I'm not sure what that is for, however. What don't you like? What do you find disrespectful and what should not be allowed? Would you please answer that for me? Um, same with being, yes, being called a racist. These are all things for them to get under your skin so that they will get what they want. That, that's why these things are done. That's why the threats are made. That's why they do these different things with you. If you don't like it and it's disrespectful, you've made it about you. 
disrespectful, calling someone's behavior disrespectful is about you being right. And my question is, what is being right get you? I'll tell you what it gets you. It gets you upset. That's why we go back to code of conduct. That's why we go back to this is what's allowed. This is not allowed. That's it. Anything else you do saying you don't like it, you've made it about you. It's disrespectful. You've made it about you. It's not about you. It never was about you. What you determine that will be allowed or not allowed is what's determined in your policies. All right, is that a question someone asked? It is. That, well, it wasn't really a question. It was just a statement that was made. It said, I don't like it. It's disrespectful and it should not be allowed. Okay, how do I choose another question that's come in? How do I, oh, how do you close the interaction if they do not get over the curve and calm down or unwilling to listen to your supportive comments? Depending on the behavior, the, the conversation may close with me asking them to leave. And if they don't leave, that could be me then telling them to leave. It depends. Once again, you're asking me a question that's situational here. Are they non-threatening? Are they just continuing to vent and vent and vent? Well, then I may intercede with something that tries to get them to problem solving. But there are some people that don't want their problems solved. And I acknowledge that. There are people that just want to vent. Well, at some point, the venting is going to have to be stopped. You may have to ask them to leave. You may have to ask them to take it up with someone else if you feel like you're getting nowhere. Okay, another comment here. I have the, op the reverse. I'm accused of disrespecting them when I simply ask them um, to follow the code of conduct. Okay, I would ask you to watch your tone of voice and I would ask you to be aware of body language. The disrespecting could be coming from tone, it could be coming from body language. Or it could be that they're not getting their way and they're just upset. All right, another comment here, being called names, it should not be allowed and the patron should be asked to leave if they continue. What does your library policy say? This is not about what I want. This is about what the organization wants. Now, if you're uncomfortable being called names, then put in your boundary statement. If it's okay in your organization for someone to call you a whatever, then put in your boundary statement. Calling me names is not allowed in this library. If it continues, then you take your next steps. I know these are hard. They are. I hope you remember that it's not personal. They're doing what they're doing. Could you just say that I'm sorry you feel that way and simply walk away? No, because they could attack you. I'm not walking. I'm not putting my back toward anyone. No way. No way, no way. I don't know what these people, uh, you know, the baggage they're dealing with. I'm not taking that chance. And by the way, are you sorry? That's a whole other workshop I could do. Sorry to me, be careful with that word, because I think sorry is very overused. And a lot of people don't put any, it's not real. No, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, you're not. It's just something they taught you in a customer service class. So if you don't mean it, don't say it. All right, here's a technique I love. It's E plus R equals O. Why do you guys know the name Jack Canfield? Type in the question area for me. It comes from Jack Canfield, that's why I'm asking. Why do you know Jack Canfield? 
Chicken soup, very good, yes. Got a couple people typing in chicken soup and Jamie says self-help, yes. And actually this comes from his self-help work. Um, Canfield talks about applying this formula, not only with angry patrons, but in life. And in doing so, you would have less stress and better outcomes. And for me, that's a win-win because there's a lot of stress going on. So here's how the formula works. Event plus response equals outcome. Canfield tells us that thousands of events that go on every day, that an event is not a football game, it's not a wedding, an event is you drove to work, an event is you answered the phone, an event is you had an angry patron, you had a happy patron, you had a nice conversation with your coworker, um, you brushed your teeth, I hope you did, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's thousands of events that go on every day. How, and, and Canfield says that in, in his version of this formula, an event is not positive, an event is not negative, an event is neutrally charged. How we respond or react to the event puts the charge into it. Once again, how we respond or react to the event gives it the charge. The angry patron is neutral. What you do with the angry patron gives it the positive or negative. And then, depending on your response, your reaction, you will get an outcome. If your outcome is stress, if your outcome is anger, if your outcome is upset, don't look at the event. Look at the response. There's incredible wisdom here. Now, many years ago when I was taught this, I was going through a divorce. And I will tell you, I was not ready for this. I looked this, at this and I thought, he's full of crap. My ex-wife is a whatever. Mm, funny how time helps you with things. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Yes, this is a quote I use in the workshop. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. And the question is, what are you doing with the space? So here's my question to you. You are driving and someone cuts you off while you are driving. That's the event. Please type in the question area how you respond or react to someone who cuts you off in traffic. I start singing happy songs. You honk, deep sigh, okay. roll your eyes. You sigh to myself, count to 10, let it go. Um, uh, apathy, uh, another comment, depends how close. Slow down, get far away, ignore them, choice words. Thank you for some reality there, Jennifer, I appreciate that. Shake fist, good. Some people tell me pound on the steering wheel, yell and scream. Some people give them directions with a certain finger on their hand. It's all good. The, the reason I ask that question is because what Canfield says is, whatever the response is, it's learned. It's learned. So I could ask you where you learned it, and many of you would tell me parents, or maybe siblings. The true question is though, What's your outcome? So you yelled and screamed at that person and now your heart rate is up, your blood pressure is up, you're feeling stressed. Canfib will tell you the car that cut you off did not do that to you, you did that to you. For the people that said that you just count to 10, you let it go, guess what? Your outcome will be different. It's the same for the angry patron. How you respond or react to the angry patron determines the outcome. The angry patron does not determine the outcome. Ooh, I just love that. And there was a deep breath that was needed there, probably for you too. All right, here's some other ones I love. Quit taking it personally. Put up a Q-tip in your work area. The Q-tip is a visual reminder to quit taking it personally. Like that one. And then I mentioned this earlier. If if these events keep coming back. What is it that you need to learn? Have you learned that stupid is a hot button? Have you learned that when people roll your eye, their eyes at you, it really bothers you? Okay, well, great. Congratulations, you have a hot button. I have bad news, you're gonna get more. It's, it's funny, I keep finding new hot buttons in life. The idea is, what can I learn from this? 
You know, I learned that when patrons cry, I have a hard time. That's mine. You can curse at me all day. Whatever. Whatever. I'm stupid. Okay, good. Have fun. I'm not taking any of it personally, but I'm still working on the crying thing. <sighs> Bottom line is, when you become angry, who's suffering? Uh, well, that would be you. And that's what we want to stop. Wow. Okay. I love to ask, what's your takeaway from the program today? What's your takeaway? What's something you want to take from here? One of the, the methods that, that I like is stop, start, continue. And that is one thing I want to stop doing because it's not working with angry patrons. One of the things I want to start doing because I think I can get a better outcome. And then one of the things I want to continue because I know it's working. If you want to use that format, that's great. Or just one thing that you feel like you learned that, uh, that you can put into practice. Because to me, webinars are great and workshops are great and they really get great when we apply what we learned. So let's see what you got here on things you wanna take. Okay, need to learn how to prevent, um, comment here, I need to learn how to prevent my automatic response, which is usually someone is yelling at me. Good, uh, to me, first step is awareness here. So if you are aware of what's happening, which is crying, which means you're getting upset, which means you're taking it personally, then your step is to look at how do you change your response. People are gonna yell, but it's not about you. If nothing else to help you with that, 90 plus plus percent of what people say to you is not about you, it's about them. And if you've not read The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, that might help. Uh, let's see, uh, using benefit language is a comment here. Uh, remembering that the angry person is not angry with me, great. I definitely need to work harder on stop to take it personally, loves the Q-tip. A lot of people like Q-tip. Uh, let's see, start regarding behavior with others as neutral. Oh man, I wish I could give you a high five. Uh, recognizing the charge that I add creates the outcome. It's not about you, it's about them. As I like to say, it's not about them unless I keep having the same thing happen over and over again, then it is about me. Um, uh, share tips with my staff, it always helps to review patron behaviors and staff responses. You'll hear a lot about that in my workshop if you come. All right, remaining calm, Lots of other libraries deal with this. Boy, do they. Uh, there's always someone to bounce ideas off of as to deal with this. Good, I would use each other as a resource. Paying closer attention to language, making positive statements. Not what we can't do, but we can do. Boy, I could ring a bell for that one. That's so important. I learned to listen better to angry people and try to deal with them. How about this? Instead of trying to deal with them, how about look for the gift? Look for the gift. They may be telling me something about our organization. They may be telling me something about me. Now, there are also some people that are just venting and angry and they aren't giving any gifts. And that's okay. A comment there about the need for more consistency. That comes from talking. That comes from sharing what we're doing. That comes from talking about our policies and what we don't like, what we need to do, et cetera. Uh, uh, this was a great reminder for reminding patrons of the rules. Um, Q-tip, never heard that before. Good reminder for me because I do take things personally. Most of us do. It's still a work in progress for me. Don't reinforce the bad. Excellent. Um, figure out my hot buttons uh, other than getting shouted at. Stop taking it personally. Start implementing better body language um, and remaining calm. Uh, oh, who is it I want to go hug? Sandra, do we want to keep the patron? Oh, that's so powerful when we use it. Stop being defensive, start using key phrases, continue giving people the benefit of the doubt. Good for you. I love benefit of the doubt. Maybe they don't know that it's our policy. Maybe they don't know that that behavior is not allowed. I need to work on and uh, not encouraging behavior even when I agree that they're upset. Good. I'm um, stating the behavior, not your behavior. Makes a big difference. Uh, that behavior is not allowed in our library. Cool. 
um, what do you mean about looking for the gift? What's the gift? Did they just tell me about we've got a process that isn't working, a system that's failing? That's a gift. Many times an angry patron can tell you things that are going on about your library that you may not know. And the gift is, are they hitting another and individually? It's hot buttons, it's words that bother me, things like that. Oh, to review our, review our code of conduct is a comment here. Um, let's see, what is the breaking point? A question here for you to call in security or the police. Certainly for me, it's if they are threatening. If they are threatening harm, if they are threatening that they're gonna do damage, um, those are automatic alarm bells for me. I'm interested to your guys' uh, comments on that. Please answer that question in chat. What is the breaking point for you to call in security or the police? I certainly have my perspective. I'm interested in some of yours. All right, so much of this last comment is, so much of this is a personal thing to learn how you can train a person to stop, how can you train a person to stop getting defensive? You practice. To me, we start with awareness. We then start with tools to not get defensive. So we have phrases. We, we say different things to the patron. We say different things to ourselves. Okay, physical threats um, would be something when threats are made. Certainly violence, I would agree. Harm to you or, uh, let's see, or other patrons, yes, good. Uh, let's see, calling police, customers have been asked to leave and refuse is good. Yeah, if you've asked them to leave and they're not leaving, then to me, why are we messing around? It, it's, it's time um, to call in. My director has always said that if you're asked, if you ask yourself, should I call the police, you probably should. Uh, if I start to question the safety of a situation, that goes back to your gut, good for you. Then I would look at getting security involved. And then being physically threatened uh, is the breaking point. If they're just being verbal, then I would try to deal with it. Okay, but the person getting defensive needs to know that they get defensive easily. No, the person chooses to get defensive easily. That's a choice. And that's where I talk about breaking behavior. Because the behavior that is go-to right now is getting defensive. But that's a choice. So what are other choices? Okay, when they won't leave, um, I always call 911. Uh, if you want police today, not an emergency number. Okay, good. Okay, Joe, I think we better bring you in. I've been going on and on with these comments here. So. Yes, yes. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I, a lot of great comments from you all today. And, it, you know, with webinars, it always always helpful to, to have your participation. So uh, I know on behalf of Andrew and myself, we are appreciative that you put so many good, thoughtful uh, comments and questions in the webinar today. Just a couple of things I will mention. Um, first of all, my little re, uh, research assignment from Andrew regarding that quote, I only had a few minutes to give to it. Um, it does seem as if B.F. Skinner, uh, way back when, in the midst of his kind of behavior theories, did have a um, something he wrote that was very similar to this quote of, um, a behavior or a, a, an action that is uh, rewarded is is repeated or whatever it was exactly. Uh, but I would have to dig in and do a little more, but my best guess after a few minutes is B.F. Skinner. I also want to mention, and I know probably a good number of you may have caught the webinar or webinars really that we had with Dr. Steve Albrecht, who is a library security expert. So to these questions regarding um, threats and when we really go from angry patrons to dangerous patrons, dangerous situations, we have recorded webinars on our CE archive. So if you're interested in that and didn't check it out the first time, uh, it will be there. Along, of course, with this webinar um, that I hope you gave you some things to think about. And uh, as I said, in a couple days time, we'll have this in the CE archives along with the slides so you can bring back to your team, uh, your colleagues to consider. 
Um, we do hope to see you all or many of you in person when Andrew is doing his tour of rails in May. Um, and obviously you'll have more time there and we'll be able to dig a little more deeply into the topic of customer service. Uh, but with that, I will will sign off. And Andrew, thank you once again for a lot of good stuff today. Thank you, Joe. Thanks everybody for attending. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone. We'll see you again soon. Bye.